So yeah, the title is slightly different because uh, there's a funny story there because usually you send your conference proposal about four months in advance and sometimes you forget a little bit what you were going to talk about, which is exactly what happened. <laughs> So I figured it out because uh, more or less I know the plan and uh, this, is, this talk is a bit special because it's more about plans and how to try to see ahead than just the normal details. So this is why this is mostly the same title actually because the never ending story of package tools is more or less that we have the system that is in production and we have to keep evolving and not break things too much so that users, uh, well, both of them keep using OpenBSD, actually. So, there and back again, uh, the idea is that sometimes uh, you try to change stuff and sometimes it fails. In that specific case, uh, about a year ago, I broke package ads intentionally. Like, uh, at some point in time, uh, you try to use package ad and uh, Either you had all package tools and new packages and it didn't work, or you had the new package tools and all packages and it didn't work either. Like this is what you got on 6.0 when uh, you uh, tried to install an old package. It was telling you that actually uh, the file that you had was a completely unsigned package, which was completely false because it was signed, but with your tools. So this doesn't happen very often. Uh, there is a very good reason for that one, and I'm going to go into details uh, in that particular instance, and then I'm going to talk about why this had to happen and why I'm trying very hard for it never to happen again, hopefully. So what actually happened in that case is uh, that we changed completely the way Signature worked in incompatible ways. And so all tools couldn't cope with a new one, which is always expected, like you had some functionality and then you discover that it doesn't work with all tools. Yeah, sure. But the old ones didn't, uh, the new tools didn't work with the old package, which is a bit new, actually. Uh, old style signatures, uh, so if you want to look at the details, you are going to find it in the history of OpenBSD, since it's no longer the case. Um, okay, the basic idea is that we want to be able to install packages on the fly, so we checksum every file, store the checksums inside a manifest file, a packing list, and the packing list itself is signed. This has, hey guys, I have a picture here. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I have a picture here on that one, so it's definitely yours. Thank you. So uh, the benefits are that you get on the flight checks. Uh, you can stop extracting an archive, an archive uh, before the end without uh, losing any security. Uh, there are some drawbacks as well, uh, one of which is that you have to rewrite the package for signing, which used to be real slow because you had to unpack everything, sign the packing list, and put everything back again. I'll talk about that more later, probably, if I don't forget. And the main drawback here is you have to pass everything to Genzip first. Welcome. Hello. Yeah, well, everything yeah, does not work. Yeah. Uh, you have to pass everything to GenZip or some kind of GenZip before you check anything. And once you start looking at the unpacking code, you realize that it's almost impossible that this code is safe. That there have to be bugs in uh, the Z library, in any version of the Z library. And, uh, well, you could be thorough and try to edit it and try to fix it. But you can also be lazy and say, okay, who gives a fuck? We're going to get to rid of that. So new deal, new style. We are going to store the signature itself outside JZip. 
so that uh, we get rid of that issue. Because then, we are never going to pass any unchecked information uh, to unpack. And, of course, we still have to trust some people. We have to trust our fellow developers to write uh, packages that aren't uh, full with Trojans and everything. But this should happen, usually. And, uh, okay, then uh, we don't care if a JZIP code is completely broken because we're only uh, passing trusted data to it. It works. Uh, side note, which is important for the rest of the talk, uh, we are not actually extending anything. Uh, like if you look at the JZIP format, there is actually a command field which we are using to put our signatures so that it still uh, appears to be perfectly normal JZIP uh, <coughs> files from the outside. If you don't have any package tools, you can still download an OpenBSD package and it will look as a perfectly normal uh, JZIP tar file, even though there are some very interesting things going on inside it. So it's a typical signature under the new scheme. Like if you look in the comment, uh, field of uh, any OpenBSD package on the, on the mirrors these days, you're going to see something like that. Uh, the interested command part is uh, Tedious Fault. Uh, I don't think it's in the room, but yeah, well, it doesn't matter. It's just uh, the way that signify is producing uh, signatures. Uh, it's going to tell you that uh, it's using uh, that specific key. Uh, like we don't really have any uh, certificate, uh, chain, trust, other OpenBSD, we don't really care about that, and it's complicated and it gets wrong all the time. So basically, any key that's installed in the right directory is going to be considered as a valid key, and that's it. So it's outside what I'm doing. I'm not very raw for that one. And uh, then we have a uh, list of keywords. Uh, just so, because we know that things are going to change at some point, so we have to provide for the future. Like here, uh, we're going to say that uh, we are using this algorithm for now. There was some discussion with uh, Nadi, uh, like which algorithm is the best for us. Like we want to have something which is reasonably small. 256 bytes, uh, bits, sorry, is enough. But uh, SHA 512, slash 256 is apparently the best way to do checksums uh, in a almost standard, in a standard way these days on uh, modern architectures. And then we have block sizes because we still want to be able to extract stuff from the fly. So looking at packages, we decided that uh, 64 kilobytes was probably the right size for each block. So this is a major departure from what was going on before. Uh, as we no longer uh, check some individual files, we uh, just check some uh, part of the compressed JZIP uh, stream. And as soon as it's actually checked to be, to be okay, to, 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 to have the right signature, we can uh, pass it to Unpacker. As far as I know, it's perfectly safe unless someone manages to break uh, one of uh, our cryptographic algorithms, of course. So why does it break? Uh, the former version of uh, signatures in package add uh, was much more friendly from a coding point of view because everything was done inside the package add proper. So you could have decent checks and decent error messages like you unpack the packing list and you see whether it's signed or not. And you can even ask the user whether they want to add an unsigned package or not. Now with a new one, package no longer knows anything, well, mostly about signatures. It passes everything to an outside program, Signify, which is going to check uh, the archive. And it's all or nothing, like uh, Signify is going to give you an error message that says, I haven't found uh, any signature, or I haven't found any valid signature. And uh, in that case, that's all that package add has to, to, to say about it, hence the message. Well, this, is, this was the first version of a message. It's a bit of a stupid message. Uh, I stumbled upon something similar during my last vacation. 
like, I don't know if you can really see on, uh, on that picture, but this is concrete, right? And you have this sign that says forbidden grass. <laughs> so this is a kind of an error message that doesn't mean anything in that case. Um, so breaking things was a conscious decision. Usually we try not to break things. But in that case, we decided, even though there is no security hole uh, in JZIP for now, that it was best to thoroughly uh, deprecate the old uh, signature process and only support the new ones. Uh, after all, this is OpenBSD, so usually when we have a choice between more security and more uh, usability, we decide to, to err on the side of security, as usual. This kind of stuff actually happens all the time. Mm. Yeah, that's the one. No? What did I do? Ah, oh, shit. Sorry. Yeah. We do change internal details of packages, ports, about every two months. And this is the one case in uh, about 10 years that users noticed anything that we had to actually break compatibility uh, in that manner. Uh, as you probably know, if you're in this room, uh, when we do releases in OpenBSD, they are usually supported uh, up until uh, two releases afterwards. So that means for a year, you are going to be able to work with OpenBSD, and then you have to upgrade all the time. Actually, this is not true for packages in general. If you're working with package tools, usually you're going to be able to play with all packages that date back uh, five or six years, like we have keywords that change. And uh, most of the time, I try to keep supporting them for a much longer period. The idea is that if we can, we shouldn't break backward compatibility as long as it's not too complex. <coughs> and this happened maybe 12 years ago, back when I was starting on package tools, more or less. And uh, at that point, things were evolving really fast. So uh, it became a case of uh, metaprogramming, like you have to have some infra infrastructure so that you are resilient to change to unwanted change. So at that point, I added a specific uh, class for all keywords in the packing list, right, specifically, very uh, intuitively named all. And uh, I've seen no reason to get rid of that structure, and usually I clean it up every five or six years, like I look at uh, any keyword in that list, and if it's been uh, there for over five years, I usually completely get rid of that because everybody who has all packages that they back that far usually has had time to upgrade and he's seen repeated messages that this is an old compact keyword and blah 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 you should update and everything. <coughs> so I'm going to talk a bit about the development process and the design guidelines in general. As some of you probably know, when you do some OpenBSD stuff, uh, we do it by remote most of the time, but we meet once, twice a year to do stuff in person. Like, uh, yeah, this one, this was the last hackathons that we had in Paris. Well, it was so long ago, I, uh, yeah, time passes. Like probably 10 years ago. And it looks like this. We put a lot of developers in the same room and we hack together, we joke together. Uh, we do lots of stuff together. <laughs> this is also from a hackathon, but a more private one with only a few select people invited to a secret place in the middle of France with mostly cheese and uh, stuff to drink and a bit of, well, over stuff to eat. Um, sometimes very cool. Sometimes. Well, 
Uh, actually, I have another way to look at hackathons, specifically ports hackathons, where I meet my fellow developers, which looks more like this. <laughs> like, I have my uh, colleagues and friends, and uh, I just observe them trying to make their way through port street and trying to fix things, trying to make things work. Is there a laundry somewhere in this room? Yeah. <laughs> Like that, yeah. He's, he's a prime example of a guy who uh, well, sometimes acts dumb on purpose so that uh, I don't get to be uh, to have too much of a hero complex and that I have to fix things so that they can understand what's going on. And this is very important, guys. I'm saying it as a joke, yeah, and uh, this is really... Uh, important to have some feedback about what you're doing so that you don't go in a crazy circle and that you don't write stuff uh, that is impossible to understand for anybody. Uh, there's also the challenge that, for real, ports work is uh, hard to do, like you are solving hard problems. Like updating stuff can be difficult. We are dealing with uh, massive amounts of code. This day we have something like 30 gigabytes of packages and everything has to keep working and there are exceptions all the time. Uh, well, some of them could be avoidable, like when you've got uh, Ed Barrett maintaining Tech Live, for instance, you know that something wrong is going to happen. But apart from that, yeah, well, uh, very, very good for keeping me in check and uh, making sure that my design uh, is sound and uh, possible to change by other people. So uh, let's talk about more personal stuff, like my actual work environment. For real, this is my preferred work environment. <laughs> so, Budapest. yeah, this is Budapest, obviously, for those of you who have been there. Uh, if you haven't, uh, if you go through Budapest, you definitely have to go to the bus. That's completely amazing, out of this world and everything. And this place, not Budapest proper, but the bath itself is probably where I do my best work. Like, uh, when you've been coding for a while, uh, I think that sometimes you have to dive deep into the code, and then you have to step back and think about what you're going to do next. Because these days, writing more code in PackageJet, it's very easy. I know the code mostly by heart, but I'm lazy, I don't want to write new code. And also I know that every time I had, I had some new code, I'm going to introduce some new bugs. The only code with no bugs is no code at all. So being away from the keyboard and um, not writing code, just thinking about stuff, uh, this is something that's really important for every aspect of a major project. If you uh, lose yourself too much in the detail of the codes, you're not going to see the big pictures and you're going to miss opportunities for uh, optimization and uh, new stuff. Like those signatures, they happen mostly by accident, the new ones. At some point I was looking at Gzip and uh, we were trying to fix something. I was trying to... to uh, what was I trying to? Yeah, I, I was trying to see if I could use uh, some stre specific streaming JZIP algorithm which would compress better and which would work with Async. And I realized that there were about five different patches for different versions of uh, the Z library and none of them were applicable to us. And then I realized what a mess this was and uh, I realized that uh, JZIP was basically broken and so that we had to put signatures outside and then everything happened. The code is trivial. The main idea is that uh, realize there is a problem somewhere and then you will fix it. Uh, actually, most of the core developers of OpenBSD uh, follow that precept. Some of them better than others, like for instance our fearless leader, who is spending lots of time outdoors instead of at the keyboard and uh, so he's a top-notch developer because of that. And you have to keep giving money to OpenBSD so that uh, we can keep uh, having hikes and hackathons and everything 
and so that we can think beyond code and uh, actually make some good designs. Uh, if you want to hear more about that, you'll have his talk on tomorrow. I guess he's going to talk about Pledge. If you don't know about Pledge, you should go and see the talk because it's really awesome for lots of reasons. Uh, back to me. Uh, I can't always be in Budapest. Uh, I guess that uh, Robert would kill me at some point. <laughs> of course. So I have uh, reproduced the same environment at home. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit easy for various reasons. And uh, well, there's actually a very interesting detail here. It's a bit shy, so it, yeah, it wanted to be fuzzy on the, the picture, and I convinced it to, to, to be on a better picture. So this is my inspiration. I keep this in the bathtub so that uh, when I take a bath, I have to think about the OpenBSD and to fix more stuff. <laughs> And yeah, I'm saying all this in terms of a joke, but uh, that's for real. Uh, when I say that uh, some of the best ideas and some of the best things that we have in our package tools uh, have been done in a bath, uh, that's true. The last one, which I'm going to talk uh, about at the end, uh, came to me while I was taking a bath. Seriously. Uh, let's talk about some specific topics in package ad, a few of them. So this is all about change. This is a part which uh, is talking about the never-ending uh, story of package tools. Um, sometimes we have to revisit uh, some decisions. Uh, some of them were not uh, mine at all. Like when I uh, decided to rewrite the package tools, we already had the package format, which is mostly a gzip tarball. Uh, there are some pros and cons for it. The most interesting things about it is that it's a perfectly standard format. So if you take a package uh, from OpenBSD and you have to look at it on an overall operating system, you will be able to look at it for the most part. It might be a bit complicated on Windows, but you can probably find tar on it as well. With luck. I don't give a fuck. Last time I ran Windows was about five years ago, I guess. Um, but still, every time that we are going to do something to our, our tools, we are going to have to question whether or not we should change stuff. And sometimes, uh, some details are, are going to change uh, while the outside appearance is going to say the same. Uh, I already talked about signatures, like you have actually a significant command field in the GZP headers these days. Uh, let's talk a bit about um, chunk gzip, um, which is something I was aware of about 15 years ago, but uh, back when we did the first version of signing, uh, Nadi reminded me of it, like, you know, you can actually pick up a file, gzip it, pick up a second file, gzip it as well, and concatenate both files together, and you will end up with a valid JZip file. Like you pass it to JZip, and uh, it will just unpack the first stream, then the second stream, and unless you specifically ask for it, you won't see the difference. It's exactly as if you had one single JZip file. So this helped a lot at first for all style signatures. Instead of having your whole package as one JZip file, needing to extract everything, sign the packing list, and then repackage everything, you can just do your package in two parts. You're going to create the beginning of a tar archive with just the packing list. You compress that. Then you take the rest of the stream and you compress it separately. So you have one JZip with just a packing list, the other JZip with everything that goes after it, and when it comes time for signing, you just unpack the first part, 
sign it, compress it again, and then you just copy the rest of the file. You don't have to gmzip and gzip it again. We went for, from, I guess, files for signing a full snapshot, for full package snapshot for OpenBSD to about 30 minutes on the same machine using this technique. What's the relevance these days? Because, as you know, we no longer put the signature inside gzips. We still use this technique for other reasons. Like, when we want to transfer packages, we actually put them inside a chunk gzip with eight files for each chunk, so that our sync is happy with it. What's going on here is that a few years ago, and again, because we already have checksums for every file inside an archive, we decided to depart a bit from the usual tar format. Well, it's still a perfectly normal tarball, but the order doesn't match the packing list anymore. These days, we have the packing list, which lists every file inside the archive, and we have the archive proper, which does list files out of order with the most recent files first and the files that didn't change at the end. So that when you upgrade your machine, instead of unpacking everything from every table, you are only going to enter the files that do change inside your, your package. And as soon as it finds that the remaining checksums are just the same, it will be perfectly happy to skip the end of the archive and uh, to tell you that the upgrade is complete. For most packages, this is not a significant win. Like sometimes you are going to get 20%, 25%. There are some exceptions. Too. If you look at stuff like the Clive, for instance, where there are lots of very small details that change, but that are completely insignificant compared to the sheer size of a package. I think that the tech life package these days, when you put everything together, you got one gigabyte of files. And on each update with this technique, uh, you get to extract maybe 5% of the tech life table. So instead of one gigabyte, 200 megabytes, no. Yeah, at most, that's a huge win. And it also work with their sync these days. Because we chunk files from the end, and we no longer store any timestamp inside the table itself, obviously, or in the packing list. And so in the end, you are going just to transfer the new chunks at the start of the archive that change, and the rest, I think is going to say, as it's supposed to do, Okay, it didn't change, so let's not transfer it. The only reason this kind of stuff keeps happening in OpenBSD is because we look at stuff that we're doing and that we are designing stuff to be fast. Uh, if we didn't have old style signatures, we wouldn't have thought about uh, chunk JZIP. And then none of this would have happened, actually. Uh, next case study, the repository format itself. Uh, one peculiarity of OpenBSD is that we don't have any index for packages. <coughs> well, we do have tools that you can use, <coughs> for instance, to look at files. We have... Uh, make package look at DB, uh, which gives you a specific package, which is basically look at database of every file in every package. But the package tools themselves do not rely on that. <coughs> at first, it was just a game. Uh, the idea was that uh, I did the first version of PackageEd, which was only doing addition. Then I did updates and everything. And I wanted to know how far 
uh, I could get without needing any index. And then at some point, maybe 10 years ago, I realized, okay, uh, I've done enough. I can manage to do everything without a global index. And so I do not need a global index. And this is good because this is one less thing uh, that needs, uh, that can get out of sync. And uh, on your local machine as well, if you look at an OpenBSD, you'll notice that there is one major difference with uh, other machines, with other operating system, which is that we don't have an actual database of uh, everything that's installed on the machine. We have a directory, uh, VARDB package, in which you have one subdirectory for each package which is installed on the machine, but there is no global database that says, okay, we have this that depends on that and everything. Everything is very fine-grained, and uh, first, it's very resilient because it can get, it can't get out of sync. Uh, there is a small price to pay. Sometimes things could be slightly faster. We are working on that, and there are some solutions. Um, and this decision has some consequences. Some contractable con consequences, actually. Uh, we have snapshots, which are about 30 gigabytes. Uh, with the tools that we have these days, we, you have one new snapshot every two or three days for our major architecture. The, of course, you're not going to get a new package snapshot for Spark 64 every three days. That would, need, that would require probably uh, 200 Sparks or something like that. No, not, not efficient. Uh, so when you upload a new snapshot, you are going to get into a sharing problem. Like at some point, you're going to have some of the new packages already transferred and some of the old packages which are still there and are in the process of getting updated. So this means that the solution that we currently have, that each package is independently signed is the only possible solution. Otherwise, you would always, if you had a global signature, like a manifest for every package, and uh, the checksum of every package uh, uh, recorded at some point, it wouldn't work. Because all the time, you would end up with uh, discrepancies, like uh, some of your package are, I don't know where the signature is and everything. There is no other solution, in fact. Like I said, there, were, there are some drawbacks to, to this way of doing things. Some limitations for the model. <coughs> Everything we do is based on package names, because when you are going to do an update, you're not going to go into that <laughs> package directory and look at every single file there are something like 9,000 packages on the FTP side these days, I think. Um, so we have to have consistent package names. Sometimes this doesn't happen. So yeah, we don't have an index, but we have an escape mechanism called quirks. Because sometimes we want to rename stuff, not too often, hopefully. And then we have to open each package to check for whether it is indeed the right update, whether there is some what stuff that's going on or not. <coughs> package Ed itself doesn't do it because it can't do everything. It's still lazy. Uh, so we use the, MT the FTP command these days, which contrary to what it says, also under HTTP and HTTPS. And that becomes a problem because it can be slow. Uh, for instance, these days, we have a very minor problem, which is that uh, you are supposed to use packaged on HTTP repository. And you can use it on HTTPS repository, but it won't be so good because each connection to the repository is going to be a separate connection using a separate FTP command. 
Uh, due to limitation of uh, our lib TLS and uh, some design decision in FTP, it means that every single FTP is going to have to re-authenticate with uh, full HTTPS to the distant repository, and it costs a lot. I said this is a minor problem because we have signatures which are completely independent from HTTPS. So whatever happens if you connect to a fraudulent repository, well, you will get uh, packages with bad signatures, and that's it. Package will stop itself right away. Uh, we shouldn't trust FTP itself, and we don't. Uh, at about the same time that we change signatures, we also uh, added some level of privilege separation to package apps so that FTP is actually run as its own user who can do anything, who can't, sorry, do anything on the system. So that's perfectly fine. So it's just a minor problem. The issue being that uh, if you are uh, using packaged on your OpenBSD system, there is still one small security implication. Uh, yeah, I think that you, you are falling asleep, so What's the security implication? You're leaking the package you're installing. Right, we are leaking the packages we're installing. Yeah. Uh, if you, if the hacker decides, well, uh, I know that I want a security update for this package, then, then if he can supply the old package indefinitely and uh, a new version for others. Yeah, that's also a valid uh, problem. The problem being that if a hacker decides to keep a copy of an old repository before there was a security update, then potentially there could be some trouble, but we took care of that. Like you have the Quicks package. Every package, if you remember the, one of the first slides, has got a timestamp, right? And uh, whenever you do uh, an update using PackageJet, it will, it will display the timestamp for Quicks, which is the main package with everything useful, every meta information for the whole repository. So you have to read, because we don't know at which rate uh, snapshots are updated, and it depends on the architecture. But you will see that your Quicks dates back from that time. So if you have a real earthquakes, it usually means that something wrong is going on. And then inside Quicks itself, you've got a list of packages with uh, security holes that have been updated since then. And during the upgrade process, if PackageEd can't find uh, a newer package for one of those with security implications, then it will tell you that there is a problem. So yeah. But it's definitely a theoretical problem, but that one we solved. Uh, yep. Uh, so, but you're still relying on the fact that you have a, a recent enough quirks. Okay. Yes, I'm still relying that I have a recent enough quirk, but I can't do anything about that. Like, uh, what's recent? Yes. For MD64, three or four days is recent. For Spark 64, six months is recent. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well. But, yeah, you have to engage your brain. We are talking about security. It's not, uh, it's not Windows where everything is insecure by default. But if you don't look at what the system tells you, you're going to run into trouble. Oops. Okay. Too much, as usual. I'm just going to finish with uh, a very recent stuff, uh, which became part of the OpenBSD package systems about less than a week ago, uh, and which is called version. Uh, I was talking about uh, package names uh, being an integral part of OpenBSD, and sometimes we do system-wide changes. This happened a few years ago when we changed uh, typedef to one sign long across all architectures. 
and this works at plus plus. Yeah, because name mangling and everything, and if you change the actual type name, so every function name changes, and you have to bump to change the specific patch version of every package depending on C++. And then more recently, we switched on to minor architectures from GCC to Clang. And this breaks all C++ again. Hmm, maybe there is something wrong with C++ after yes. all. <laughs> <laughs> so we did bump uh, every package the first time. Uh, the people who helped doing that are still scared by it. We don't want to do it again, so this time we decided, okay, we're not going to do it. We're going to tell people, uh, well, fuck you, I don't like you, and you have to update everything by hand. Force an update. And then Stuart, who is a very smart guy, uh, convinced me that maybe I should try to find something else to do. And at first I thought, I'm not going to do that because... Uh, Basically, I need to put a uh, base system dependency somewhere. And I hate that because I'm going to end up with a file in source that uh, I will have to bump from time to time and I'm going to run into TO all over again, uh, which is a problem because when you get two heroes in front of each other, they fight usually. And uh, in the buff, I realized I was going at it all wrong. Like, I don't need at all to have a dependency on the base system. I can put it directly inside the package. And first version was born. Like, what we have right now is that each package has got a kind of uh, serial number that gets bumped uh, inside the package system proper <coughs> without any reference to the source system and without any dependency to external stuff. It's very simple, like uh, if you have a package that says uh, version zero, and then you look at the snapshot and you see a package that says version one, okay, that's a new package. I just update. Uh, the way it builds, uh, it's built, it's a bit strange. We have a, a flag to package create, which is minus V, where that you can use multiple times to build a version number by adding numbers together. Uh, the idea is that it's very simple to do that without needing uh, any make magic so that you can have machine independent parts and machine dependent parts uh, in the same make file. Like currently, you have the whole OpenBSD system which is at version zero. And then when you run AMD64 or other Intel processors, it goes up to one because of the second minus V. And it turned out to be incredibly simple. Like, if you look at this patch, for the amount of code I had to change, it's about 20 lines, all considered. And it changed everything. Like, now we have a mechanism that was used to move to GCC to Clang seamlessly. Like, if you're running OpenBSD stable and you move from 6.1 to 6.2, you won't notice, hopefully, that uh, we change compilers, especially the package system. Well, you will notice that you will update almost every package, but that's it. And it can be used again in the future without needing anything more. So that's really cool in the end. Uh, yeah, well, I was a bit long, so I was also going to talk about the future. But uh, I don't think I have any time for that. So. Yeah, maybe another talk next year. Thank you. And of course, I'm going to take questions, if there are any. No, but uh, I, I can talk in this one, maybe, for, for once. Any questions? For those of us uh, running snapshots on OpenBSD, uh, are there any ways we can make our lives, lives easier? Sometimes I'm in the situation where I installed a version of userland, and it turns out the snapshots of packages are not yet updated, so I have to wait 12, 24 hours. Is there any way I can know beforehand that I'm not blowing my system away for the next day? 
Uh, I'm afraid that we don't have enough uh, human resources to, to be able to help you on this one. Like, uh, the most we could do is to get the turnover to be faster, which we already did. But uh, basically, being able to inform you that uh, when the snapshots are going to, to be online, it's just uh, extra communication, which takes more time. Like, uh, if you do this stuff, you're going to have to wait for a few more hours each time, probably. Uh, also, I think that there is some paranoia involved. Like, some details of the signing process are not completely public, who's signing on which machines this is done. And uh, we don't want to leak information concerning that. Sorry. Well, maybe I can reply to this question. You, everyone has his own axe, and you can uh, just uh, follow the CVS commits, see when the library gets bumped, for example, and you just compare with what's on the mirror right now, because as Mark told, you can extract the package and look what's inside, and you will see in the signature if it matches uh, what's in the package will match what you will have on your running snapshot. So maybe you can uh, download the snapshot, look at the last library when, when it was uh, bumped. In the case of libraries, when you have uh, breaking change in the kernel, of course it won't work. But then you can compare that the snapshot will match the libraries which are uh, in the packages. Hmm. And everyone has his own axe this way. Uh, actually, there might be a solution. Uh, assuming the kernel doesn't change too much, because you will be fucked then, obviously. Uh, you could use the tools that we use to, to build ports, uh, pwoot, in your shoot. Uh, you can use it to populate uh, an area of a disk with a snapshot, for instance. And then you go into, into that area, and you could try to do a package add minus n there to check whether or not uh, it will work. That's a bit intensive, but uh, at least there's uh, almost no human inf intervention. You probably can do that in, with a shell script that would be about 20 line, lines long, but it will be slow. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we With this package versions, do you bump them manually? Do you bump the version for all packages or only for that that are affected by some GCC, GCC plus uh, or C++ update? Uh, the idea is to bump everything system-wide, more or less. Like, uh, we have this uh, mechanism that some people objected to, but we are, that we are very happy to have these days, which is that you can have uh, arch-independent packages, package arch equal to star. And basically, I use that to not put any version in my packages because I know that those packages are just uh, uh, text files, more or less, and uh, because they are independent of the architecture. And everything else got bumped. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of um, being safe, better than sorry, because uh, you already have dependencies where you more or less know that most packages that depend on Clang have been updated. Like, uh, if you depend on the C library, on the C++ library, of course, you're going to get bumped. But it didn't catch everything. So we just decided to bump it all. We don't have enough in human resources to check every single package that there is compatibility. But I got it right. The package um, with the uh, arch star are not updated by the version. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there is no version in those packages. And uh, this mechanism is actually... Uh, uh, somewhat more generic, like if we want to add an overall part to the version part, we could. There's a question over there. Yeah, perhaps it uh, doesn't really fit the model, but uh, if you have uh, reproducible builds, then, then you might be able to say, well, I'm uh, rebuilding this package, but it's but the result is the same, so there's no need to upgrade. Uh, well, we try to have reproducible parts for lots of stuff, but uh, actually it deters from security. If you look at a recent OpenBSD machine, you'll notice that it does running its kernel in random orders, it running some libraries in random orders, and we try to add some randomization so that some kind of exploits are more complex. So reproducible builds, yeah, that's a nice goal when you are trying to debug stuff. But uh, 
it's more complexity because then you in an open BSD setting you will have to have different switches so that sometimes you build reproducibly and over times you have uh, more security and uh, but while well, there are bugs and uh, you, you're going to run into them I, I have a very specific sample of a recent problem that we had to fix after we switched to clunk on uh, almost every OpenBSD executable, you've got uh, an OpenBSD specific section, which is called OpenBSD Random Data, which is mostly used to see the canary generator for stack protection and everything. And Clang, which is a bit stupid, just decided that because it's a section it doesn't know about, it ought to be filled with zeros. And we had to fix that. And this was completely out of the blue. Nobody who worked with Clang noticed until, I think it was Theo himself who noticed that uh, it was the case. And if you do reproducible build, then you lose some of the security features that we have. And if you do that as a switch, uh, then maybe you will break something and you will notice six months later, like this yeah. happened for some of our OSs. Let me just leave X. <coughs> So, yeah. Okay. All right. If there are no further questions, uh, I'd like to thank Mark for your mm -hmm. presentation. And thank you for listening, guys.